Welcome to C-Suite Marketing Perspectives Podcast. I'm Steve McDonald, your host. And today we've got a very special guest, Warren Zena. Warren is the founder of the CRO Collective. And Warren, I'm going to let you introduce yourself a little bit more as we get into this. But the topic that we're going to talk about today is a really important one. Why do B2B CROs fail so quickly? CMOs, CROs have the shortest tenure in the C-suite. The finger tends to point that direction. So we're going to explore today why do B2B CROs fail so quickly and what we can do about that. But if you could start off and just tell us a little bit about your background in the CRO Collective to start, that would be fantastic. Sure, Steve. Um, thanks for having me again. I know we had a couple of good conversations and I've been enjoying them. So I appreciate this, this time. Uh, and this is a great topic. I, I came out of the sales and marketing space back when Lincoln was president. I grew up selling media services and selling creative services, and then I really got more into selling B2B marketing because I got involved in technology. But mostly I was selling marketing services, and so I kind of had a good marketing and sales background. I can kind of do both in a way. And uh, I didn't realize that that was setting me up for an interesting future, but uh, what I came to understand later on in my career, I became an executive at some big holding companies I saw how marketing and sales relationship between marketing and sales is broken. I don't think anyone would disagree with this. There's probably a thousand books on this topic, but more importantly is like, what's really going on? Why is it like this? And how come most of the fixes that are put in place don't really work? The main revelation was if I try and create alignment or collaboration or what other remedies people come up with, what's missing is leadership. There isn't anyone who's in charge of all of it. And it can't be the CEO. The CEO is too busy doing what CEOs need to do. And it occurred to me not five, six years ago, the chief revenue officer really is the person who should be really managing the revenue operation. I made a distinction between a sales organization and a revenue operation. And a chief revenue officer, the definition of that role, we're going to dig into this based on the topic of, of this conversation, is very ambiguous. You can ask five leaders of a company what the CRO is and they'll give you five different answers. And that's a unique problem with a C-suite role. There's no other C-suite role that has this problem. Everyone knows what a CTO is and a CMO is, a CFO. There's no ambiguity about it, right? You can define it. Now, they may use it differently, but generally speaking, everyone will have the same definition. But a CRO doesn't have the benefit of that, and that's the problem. And so the CRO Collective is out to fix that problem by training people to be chief revenue officers, providing a certification for chief revenue officers. And I'd say equally, or maybe more importantly, is to help companies understand what a chief revenue officer does so that when they hire one, they can get the value out of that person and really benefit from it in a way that they should be. And which is a good sort of segue into this topic, which is why don't they work, right? That's uh, how we got this business going. It's been five years now and it's been, been a lot of fun. Well, let's start out with maybe your definition. You got into it lightly there, but what the definition in your mind of what a CRO is, and then we can start to unpack why is it that with the lack of maybe a good definition that contributes to some of the reasons why they're failing today? Yeah, sure. So a good way to talk about what a CRO is, is to really more talk about what a CRO is not. So what a CRO is not, is a CRO is not a head of sales. And most are hired that way. Most CROs listening to this right now and CEOs listening, I'd say the majority certainly are all probably, that's the way that they have a CRO configured today. I will say, it's not an opinion. I will say, I, I believe it, it is a fact. Again, we can argue this all day long, but that's not the correct way to employ one. And I think that the mistake that is being made, and it's not necessarily because I don't, I'm not saying there's anyone is incompetent or anything like that. I think it's a habit that was created in the marketplace that people bought into. Any other general way that we do things, like why do we do a lot of things that we do just because everybody else does? And we all have really strange habits that to us seem normal. And I think that businesses have the same thing is that there's just ways in which B2B companies have evolved over the last 30 years or 20 years that have created just very how do I say, knee-jerk, checkbook sort of ways in which they do things. But there hasn't been a lot of thought that's gone into it to maybe unpack it a bit and say, maybe we should do it differently. And the other problem is that if you think about this, businesses are like pieces of a puzzle. So if I'm a B2B company, I'm not like an independent entity out there. I'm connected to other things. I'm connected to programmatic systems. I'm connected to operating systems. I'm connected to financial systems. I'm connected to organizations. And those organizations all are designed to operate 
by connecting with companies that are all designed the same way. That's the way they're built. So you have to conform to the universe in order to survive as a business. And that has you forced to make decisions that a lot of times don't make sense. So I'm disrupting things in a way. And in a respect that, to answer your question, chief revenue officers, what they should be doing is really overseeing the entire revenue function of the business, all revenue-related aspects of the business, or what I call the customer-facing parts of a business, which are the sales organization, the customer organization, and the uh, marketing organization are the three parts of the business that touch customers the most. And that's the CRO is the purview of the CRO should be overseeing all of those functions and not only overseeing them, but for the purposes of leading them, coordinating them, and aligning them into a system where revenue functions work together to accomplish the outcomes that the company wants from a revenue perspective. So that kind of forces you to have to just wrestle with this difference between marketing, sales, and revenue, which is, they're not the same. Sales are activities generated by a sales organization, which we all know what those are, that are pipeline management and cold calls and conversations and prospecting and then deal closing. All the motions that go into a sale are a part of a revenue activity. They're not the whole thing. Marketing might, might be even more important in many cases than the sale functions. And they're very much part of a revenue operation and they should be inculcated that way. A CRO's job is to coordinate these things so that they're done in a way that actually makes them all work together seamlessly and builds what we call revenue engines. So that's what a CRO's role is in my view. What you're describing there is a system that has been created with silos built in. Right. And I've done a lot of work and I've talked to a lot of CMOs and, and we've done a whole series on why the B2B CMOs fail so quickly. And a huge part of that is misalignment and that you've got people that are on equal stature inside of the C-suite. You've got chief customer officers, you've got chief marketing officers, you've got chief revenue officers or chief sales officers that have sometimes very different distinct plans goals, and a horizon where they need to show a return on investment. And all of that creates misalignment, right? That's one of the biggest things that, that I think that you're talking about here is there has to be one leader. What Give me some examples, because I know that you teach B2B CEOs and CROs and people that want to be CROs. How do you bring this into an al alignment? And, yeah. and what's your point of view on that? From the beginning of this business, I just was trying to bring more clarity to the role of CRO and define it better. But what quickly I understood is that what we're really solving, Steve, is revenue misalignment. That's the disease, right? So I look at the business like a person, people, and businesses evaluate themselves symptomatically. People say, we have a sales problem. We have a marketing problem. We have a customer retention problem. And those things are probably all true. But those are symptoms of a bigger problem, which is revenue misalignment. Those are the reasons why those issues prevail. That doesn't mean to say that there's re the sales organization will magically become fixed if I align everything. But what will happen is if I align things, we'll get into what that means in a second, what it is that's going on in the sales organization, two things happen. One is it becomes much more evident what actually is wrong with the sales department. It's usually not what you think. And the second thing is it becomes easier to understand how to remedy it when you see that it's part of a system as opposed to just a function of a business. And that's the problem. To your point, talk about revenue misalignment with these silos that you're talking about. This is exactly right. If I'm running a business, and let's go back to my earlier point, which is like we're on this sort of treadmill of just building companies with the same model. It's almost like a Lego kit. You open up a Lego kit, the startup Lego kit, and it has the C-suite person that does marketing and the suite. It's all built for you in a way. And everyone around you agrees with it. They're all asking, where's your CMO? Well, I don't want you to have one yet. Where's your SDR organization? Why don't you have one yet? There's these very like bland questions being asked. What ends up happening is if I'm starting a business at the $1 to $5 million mark, it makes perfect sense at that stage. And it's imperative, in fact, that I focus mainly on the sales channel at that stage because at that stage, what you need most is customers because you need to show value about your product. And two reasons, when you want to show the market, that there are people willing to buy this thing. But more importantly is you have to have people to test it out on. You got to have people buy it and use it. So if it works, this makes perfect sense, which is why it is that most startups are really ostensibly sales organizations 
And usually it's the founder and someone else who's doing that selling. So sales becomes the lifeblood of the company, as it should be, because it's appropriate. Then what happens is if you're successful and you have five, 10 million in revenues, there's not a system in place for the organization to then recognize that a level of organizational complexity has now taken place where if we don't recalibrate our focus, we're going to become a sales and then a sales and marketing organization. We're going to get a marketing person. We're going to give this person some KPIs or usually things like make us some decks or some you know, collateral or maybe figure out what channels we need to be on. And we send them off their marching orders and we say, marketing, your job is to get us leads, right? Because we have the sales organization, we need more st people to talk to. So marketing, get us out there and get us people that we can talk to. So I think that's the first problem with this misalignment takes place is because marketing is now given a mandate that many times is arbitrarily determined. Like, how do you know what a lead is? How is that determined? It, many times it's very arbitrary at the best. And also marketing is not best at getting leads. Marketing is better at creating, informing, and educating people about things. And so silos are created very quickly. And then the part that really seals the deal is to your earlier point, is that I call the C-suite traffic jam is now I'm going to promote people. I'm going to make my head of marketing a, a, a CMO and I'm going to make my head of sales a CRO for, for reasons we can get into. So I've now I've embedded, I've almost codified silos into my company because now I've got two C-suite leaders who are responsible for two different functions. And now what happens is this is the human element. Now those two people, no matter how mature they are or good they are, they're going to protect their turf. They're going to want to maintain their budget. They're going to maintain their value. They're going to want to maintain their employment. They're going to want to get credit and attribute themselves to uh, outcomes. And so they're going to build their organization such that they get that credit and that they maintain their focus and that they're hold on things. And the marketing department is going to do the same thing. So you've created, in a way, two separate identities and agendas within one organization when in fact they really should be part of the same single identity. If you don't undo that, those factions and those silos are going to get bigger and more pronounced. And what happens is the sales leader gets promoted to a CRO and the CRO now is really running sales. And now that person is given a heightened level of visibility because now they probably also report to the board. They have a C-suite title now. Now they got to do board meetings and they're doing much more complex work. They're presenting forecasting and EBITDA reports and profitability reports and all these other things. And that person is going to become so entrenched in that, that the vagaries and variables and mercurial aspect of any business is going to have an effect on this person because as soon as it doesn't work out, they're going to get rid of them and they're going to bring in somebody else. That's just how it works. It's a very vulnerable position in that space because you're not connected to anything. You're like an island within a business. And um, this is the reason why CMOs and CROs don't last for different reasons. I'm, I'm going to stop there because I know we want to talk about that, but uh, I just want to respond to your question related to a misalignment and how it happens because that's exactly what we're seeing is going on in the market right now. That's the environment that we're in today. And this misalignment, you have an interesting story because as part of your career, you were an executive in, an, in ad tech companies. You had companies that were coming and pitching you, right? You were buying B2B services. So you were on the other side. You've been on the selling side. You've been on the receiving side of the sales message. And you were telling us the story about like when you did your research and what you were reading online and the content about the products and the services of companies, and then the sales organization would come in and what would happen? Because I think it's a really good example yeah, of yeah. misalignment in one aspect that I want to then Kind yeah, of it's a good talk about it in a bigger way. It, the question is like, how does misalignment manifest itself in the marketplace? Because right? mm -hmm. it happens internally. Everyone can feel it internally. There's always right. factions and you're fighting with the marketing organization and all that stuff. But externally, it's worse. It's worse for, pe for people that are in the what I call the customer life chain. If you're a prospect of a company, if you're a customer, you should be treated like one because you're a future customer. Let's say productivity software. So I go to the marketplace and I start digging around trying to find productivity platforms, which you know and I know. There's like dozens of them. I do my research, ask my friends, which ones do you use? Everyone has their own opinion. It's not clear. There wasn't one winner. I get three different people saying three different things about three different companies. So I ask them all to come in and pitch to me. So all three of these different companies come in. Now, bring it down to me more. Now, 
they're bringing this to me. I have a budget. Now, I'm not an operator. I'm a seller, right? Really. I'm a salesperson, a marketing person, which means that, again, to your point about this story is I'm looking at these conversations from a much different perspective. I'm not looking at it in as much so much like I'm going to find out which one of these products is better for me. I'm looking at it like, how do these people sell to me? Because I'm fascinated by that. I like to see how companies engineer their communication strategies to people that they're trying to convince that they have the right solution. How do they do it? Do they do it through visualization? Do they do it through research and discovery? What, what, what's their process? I'm fascinated by this. So when these people are selling to me, I'm a pain in the ass because I'm looking at it from a different way. I'm evaluating their behavior, not their product, really. Because to me, I'm not saying I'm right here, but the way I look at the world is that says more about the company than the product, in my view. Like if I see them have their shit together around the way they construct their communication, I think, okay, they've got a good organization here. Everyone's on the same page. That, that's probably going to be a good company to work with because that says a lot about them, mainly because it's just rare. It doesn't happen a lot, right? So what I saw was fascinating is I'm looking at the marketplace. I'm, I'm seeing like how these companies talk about themselves, the language they use to communicate their value, the messaging they choose to work with, the value proposition that they selected to use as their pointy end of the stick. And then the salespeople come in and I want to see how that ladders up to more expanded version of that conversation. And invariably, most of the time, they're not related at all. The salespeople come in and they have a completely different way that they talk about things. Almost not related at all to the way the marketing is. It happens all the time. And so I'm thinking about like, oh, I know what's going on here because I've ran these businesses before. What happened is, this is common, this is a perfect example because what marketing was given marching orders. They were told, go out and create a story for us so that we can get people to listen to us. Whatever it could be. It could be content or messaging or advertising. It doesn't matter. And then they say, okay, sales team, the sales leader, go out and get us leads and prospects, you know, get, get meetings. And the, 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 the salespeople are having a much different experience with their interactions than marketing people are. Because they're looking at the world from a different place. If I'm in, if I'm a salesperson and I'm talking to customers on the phone and listening to their objections, what I'm going to do if I'm a good salesperson, I'm going to start to modify my pitch to accommodate what it is that I hear all the time, right? I'm going to adapt to the marketplace. And I'm going to formulate the way that I see works best because when I look at the deals that I close, I go, I'm going to reverse engineer the way that I spoke to those people. I'm going to keep doing it over and over again. And then if the sales organization is good, they're going to borrow from that person. The head of sales is going to say, talk to John. He closes the most deals, find out how he talks to people and talk to them the same way, which is a sensible thing to do. And it never is the same the way marketing. It's always the way sales talks to people. So right there, you see what, what is going on. They should be informing each other. They don't have to be the same, but they should be in relationship. If I'm in marketing, I should go to sales. If I, listen, if I'm running marketing, I want to talk to the person that's closing the most deals and say, hey, what's working? What is it that you're saying to these people? That's having them buy because I need to figure out how to turn that into a marketing conversation because obviously it's turning us into customers, right? And vice versa, if I'm a sales organization and I see marketing is getting all these people that are responding very quickly to some marketing effort they do, I want to know what was it that you said to those people that had them come into our funnel so I can make sure that my message is consistent with that so that we're on the same page because... If I give my customer a mixed message, it's going to make them confused and not come up. But people don't have these conversations. And the mm -hmm. reason they don't is because there isn't anybody in charge of all of it. There's someone running sales. There's someone running marketing. And they're both being rewarded for what they're doing, but they're not really connected. So this is the CRO role, which what I'm talking about is the somebody who looks at the whole thing and builds an organization where the systems that I'm referring to are baked into the process that marketing and sales don't operate independently, that they are actually collaborating in the respective way that they're going to market and it becomes a better story. So that as a customer, to go back to my story, when they come in, it's consistent. Like they're saying the same thing and now they're going to expand on it. So what was interesting to me is now going to be explained. And that makes me feel like I was listened to. No one likes to feel like they're bamboozled. I don't like to have someone come into my office because something interests me and then they talk about something else. It feels like a bait and switch or it feels like they don't know what they're talking about. So uh, the problem is, I think, unless you break down these silos and make a cohesive organization, you're always going to have this situation. But the only way to do it, and I'm going back to my original thesis here, is there needs to be somebody 
whose job role is to build that aligned revenue function. And it has to be the chief revenue officer. It, you can tell from this conversation, it really doesn't make sense for it to be the CMO because a CMO is really understandably focused on just one of those pieces. It's got the word marketing written in, right? It doesn't mean a CMO can't be a good CRO. They could be. But to have both of those functions in a business, you're essentially codifying two executively led silos that are going to ultimately not be on the same page by virtue of all the dynamics that I just talked about. And that's commonly what's happening in the marketplace. And then we didn't even talk about customers, people who've already bought the product. They're buying it already. They're using it. They're having their experience with it. You need them to renew or upgrade or expand. Sales and marketing are so focused on, that, sorry, the top of the funnel that the customers get ignored completely. And the chief revenue officer needs to be focused almost even more on the existing customer group because they're the ones that are ultimately going to get you your most money because it, it's easier to make more money for people that are already customers and ones you're trying to get new ones. So this is why customer success needs to be part of this because the customer renewal or the customer expansion is going to be such a key part of the business. And in the same vein, if I'm now a buyer and I become a customer, now if it's a siloed organization, I'm having a third experience of what it's like to be a user of the product, which many times wasn't at all like the way that people sold it to me was like, why didn't you tell me these five things, you know? And I, I see these being such a broken chain that the only logical solution is to have someone in charge of it. And that person needs to be capable of doing it. So that's the purpose of this whole thing. So I know it's a long answer, but this is the dynamics of what's going on in, in companies today and what needs to be addressed so that companies can scale. Here's the way that I sympathize what you're saying, right? Is that we tend to think that there's, there is somebody in charge of revenue, right? It's the CEO, right? The CRO, the CMO, the CSO, everybody reports to the CEO. So why isn't the CEO playing this role? Well, it was interesting because there's in a recent Wall Street Journal article, nine out of 10 B2B CEOs felt that they had a very clearly established role that the CMO was playing. Guess what? 22% of the CMOs thought that their role was clearly established within the organization. So your point about the CEO being in charge of everything, that includes manufacturing or technology, product development. There's so much that the CEO needs to do. And most CMO or CEOs are in charge of getting that next round of funding, right? That can be a significant portion of what they're doing. That yep. leaves a big vacancy in terms of who's in charge of revenue. And if the chief revenue officer is a chief sales officer, there's another thing that comes in here, right? You've got a, you've got a quota on your head, right? You've got a very short term number that you're traveling towards where a CMO and the typical role that they play is to absolutely get leads, fill pipeline, be very revenue focused, but they have to be thinking about the overall positioning of the company, right? The establishment of the expertise of the company, trusted advisor status, the things that are the predecessors to gaining the authenticity and the credibility in the sales department, right? This misalignment that you're talking about is not just, like you pointed out, not just a marketing message and a sales message. It's a unique point of view of the company. It's positioning of the company. It's the ICP of the company. It's the emphasis of where resources are going to be spent in the company, dedication of, of manpower in the company. There needs to be one plan. Yes. You have this conversation with CEOs prior to them hiring the role of a CRO, and you paint the picture of what happens when alignment does come into place. Right. And, and we can all like paint that picture in our mind, but when you, when you're consulting with the CEO on why you need to be CRO, you're you're consulting with the CEO on why you need to be CRO ready. What does that look like? What's happening usually is to get the origin of the discussions I'm having, the, the point at which I reach people is and ironically, it's a marketing thing, really, because I'm not really doing any selling. I'm only doing marketing really. I just put out a lot of content and I'm educating them about something so that it hits the right person who is at the point at which what I'm saying matters to them. And that's what marketing is. So it may be like, for example, there's a lot of things you and I read every day that we find interesting. 
but they're not relevant yet because that problem isn't in front of me. Now, I may remember it later when that problem is in front of me and I'll go back to it and say, oh, that's right. Remember that amazing thing I looked at? So the point at which I usually talk to somebody is, A, a CRO, a CEO, here's what I'm saying. And either A, they're about to hire a CRO and something I said had them go, oh, I maybe should be thinking about this differently. I want to talk to him about that. Or they already hired one and they're like, shit, I didn't do this right. I get what he's saying. And I could see that it's about to go the way he's talking. And I want to do, know if I can do something about it. So let's say in scenario A, it's someone who's about to hire a CRO. So they'll say, what do you mean by this? What do I have to do to become ready for one? So it's a couple things. So the first thing is just first, before you be ready for a CRO, let's have a conversation about why it is you want to hire one. What's the business outcome that drove you to this decision in the first place. And usually it's, well, our sales organization is messed up. That's usually what they say. And I said, so why don't you hire a sales? Why a CRO? And that's a provocative moment for them because they have to think about like, that's a good question. I didn't really think about that. And the answer usually is something like this. It's usually commonly, well, you know, we sort of think we need someone a little more senior than that. You know, I think it'd be better for us to have someone more experienced, some executive leadership, because I think that's where we're at right now. And I think that if I had a CRO, it would communicate a different level of authority in the organization. And I think it would be, I'd get a different caliber person and stuff like that. And the other one is, I guess I just always thought that CROs run sales. That's just what I thought was the case. I didn't hear this point of view before. And I can impeach any argument to this. I can't lose this one. Anytime anyone tries to, it doesn't work. I have a answer for this. I've been doing this for a long time. And so usually it gets us like the point where I'm trying to Either have a very open-minded, very smart, very like level-headed person who's like, okay, wow, that's interesting. I'm learning. Thank you very much. And then I have the ones that fight me on it and they want to convince that they're right about something. Invariably, I think ultimately they submit to my point of view and they're like, okay, yeah, this does make sense. I see what you're saying. So what do I do about it? Okay, so the first thing you have to do is if you agree with me that a CRO should run your whole revenue organization, then you should look for somebody like that. And that means you need to find somebody who has a specific skill set. But more importantly, Steve, let's say, your company has to be ready for that person because the second mistake you're about to make is that you're going to go find somebody that you think is qualified. And they're going to come in and they're just going to make it happen for you. It doesn't work that way. Your organization has to be set up for that person to succeed, which is why it is that even the greatest people who are the most qualified CROs fail because it had nothing to do with them. It had to do with the environment that they were brought into, which wasn't going to work for them. They were set up to fail because you, here, here euphemistically as, this, as a leader, weren't really prepared to understand what that person needed, how they needed to be supported, the kind of organization they need to run, the level of authority and autonomy and resources and runway that they need. And if without that stuff, the best person in the world would, wouldn't succeed. And the biggest mistake you can make is hiring the best person you can find and screwing it up because they're hard to find. And then the other part of it is that this person is going to be expensive. These people are half a million bucks in, in, in minimum plus whatever revenue that you're going to tie to this person in your projections. Like this person is intended to not just come in and just be an expense. This person is designed to come in and change the trajectory of your company by a certain degree. And that's going to be another expense for you because if that doesn't get hit, then that's a number that you're now down because you didn't hit it. So there's the salary plus the outcome, this is risky. Why would you wing it? Like, it doesn't make any sense for you to just do it just because the reasons you just gave me, they're not even persuasive reasons, to be honest with you. What you really need to do is figure out like what's going on with your company. And that's the first part of it is let's first figure out what's really going on because you have a, and it's no insult to you, Steve. It's just, you probably have like most CEOs, a high level view of what's going on and you've made opinions about it based on observations and maybe some information. But rarely do my clients ever really have a really granular, like very high fidelity understanding of what's really going on because they're not looking at it first from the right perspective because you don't have the ability to or you don't have a process for it. So what we do first is we'll assess what's really happening in your revenue operation across a bunch of different functions like your market, your TAM, your ICP, your compensation, right? Your people, right? Your processes, your data, your tech. And we'll be able to say, this is what's really happening. This is what's going on. So we're both looking at the same thing. And then we can say, okay, now based on where you are, and we map that against where it is you want to be, we can see the gap and we can say, what type of CRO would be capable of closing that gap? And what would the specific remit of that CRO need to be able to afford to do that 
So what that does is it creates a job description for that CRO. It makes their function really clear what they're supposed to do. It gives them a very clear mission of things they have to work out. It gives you a really clear profile of the kind of person you need to bring on to do that with. It keeps them securely inside of a leadership strategy role where they need to be and not pulled into a sales role, which without what I just told you would happen. In three months, you'd probably get tired of this person spending all this money of your OPEX and you'd probably say, get into some deals because the board is freaking out. We can't see the ROI on you yet. Go into sales and get some deals closed so you can make me feel like I got my money's worth and then you'll never take them out. That's it. Once they, Once you do that, that person's stuck in sales forever now. That's it. That person's not a CRO anymore. And that's why they're not going to last. They'll probably, t- about 12 months later, this person's going to go, screw this, when I, how this happened, I don't want to be here. And you both part ways. And so what we're doing is we're creating a strategic mission that involves all parts of your business that you have someone responsible for building that has clear outcomes, like very clear. Like your, your metrics are very black and white. They're not ambiguous. It's like these things will increase. This will change. These processes will be more efficient. We'll make this much more revenue. We'll build more productivity. We'll create more profitability. We'll reduce our OPEX. We'll uh, recalibrate the way we hire. We'll uh, re-identify our ICP. We'll change our marketing strategy. These are you know big things. And that's a two, three, four year project. That's a job. That's a real job. you know. And so that's the difference and when you have that person in place with that level of clarity and that sort of strategic mission, it uh, brings to fore a much larger, longer view of your business that you can now look at with a lot more confidence that you have a real plan as opposed to plotting along quarter by quarter, which is what most people do. So we're trying to create more of a longer term strategic viewpoint with the right person, with the right role and the right remit and the right resources and support to do it. We've talked about a ton here. And if you could summarize maybe in your mind, the top three reasons why B2B CROs fail so quickly. First one is they weren't hired to do the right job. They had the CRO title, but they're running sales. That's the first reason. The second one is they got the right job, but the company didn't know what to do with them. It's like you buy the really, really expensive snowblower, but you don't really know how to use it. So you don't use it all the time. When you do, you don't really get the most out of it. So it sits in the garage. It's just like that. And it ends up just becoming something you sell on Facebook Marketplace in a year because it just didn't work out for you. And then the third one is, is that the company brought the CRO in. They had the right remit. They knew what they needed. They knew what it was. They got themselves prepared, but they brought the CRO in too soon. So what happened is the CRO got brought in, but there wasn't enough complexity. And without that complexity, this big costly person, I'm going to have them get into some deals so that I can show with their value. And then they just become a salesperson. Like they become a sales leader. It just happens. So there's timing. So you have to bring the person in at the right time, in the right way, with the right environment. And if those things aren't in place, most of them last around between 12 and 16, 17 months. Well, I know that there is going to be some CROs, some CEOs, some CMOs that are going to have some follow-on questions. Would it be appropriate that I, just, I maybe gave a link to your profile on LinkedIn uh-huh. so people can get a hold of you? Of course. Yeah. So LinkedIn is the best way to reach me. My website has all my information on it. I have a lot of stuff on my website and I have a YouTube channel with dozens and dozens of videos where I'm talking about these things. Plus I have a podcast called the CRO Spotlight, which you can listen to. And there's a lot of interviews I do with people talking about these things. Happy to talk to you, you know, help you solve these problems. I uh, enjoyed the conversation very much. I appreciate you having me on. All right. Well, thank you, Warren. We appreciate all the insights. And I know this is just the beginning, the tip of the iceberg, right? But my biggest takeaway here is what you said right up front was there has to be one person in charge of revenue because there's right. so many elements. Too many chefs in the kitchen. Yes. The kitchen right. can be well populated, but there needs to be one chef in the kitchen. Yes. That's the thing, right? I would say the next time we talk, we should talk about why it is I don't think that companies should have CMOs. That's going to raise a few eyebrows. <laughs> Raising mine. It's a conversation. It's a good one because it's, I have a compelling story about that. Maybe, I know, because the, the focus that you have in your business, it would be interesting to talk about. Well, thank you. This has been eye-opening, and we'll look forward to that next installment. All right. Great. Thank you.